Maintainable Software podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On today's show, we'll be speaking with co-founder and CEO of Bugsnag, James Smith. James Smith, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So there's a number of topics that I like to cover with you today. But first off, how would you define technical debt? Ooh, it's a tough one. I think that um, for me, technical debt is anything that slows down the maintenance or creation of uh, of new product inside of a code base. I think that's a massive oversimplification. I think that technical debt for me tends to lean more towards the emotional side as well as the the measurable side. And I think that the times I hear most about technical debt is when someone is mad at something in their code base, is when someone cannot get something done. And so, yeah, the emotional side of, of drag in your code base, I think, would be a good definition. All right. I'm assuming your company deals with its own technical debt. Oh, yeah, for sure. We've been around for about six years now. So um, we've managed to start splitting things up into a, a pretty decent set of microservices over the past few years, which is definitely helping clear ownership there and clear um, owners of the code base and clear things that each service should do, I think has made it easier to retire services rather than have to, to deprecate code. But yeah, I think that the area that probably has the biggest technical debt is our, our dashboard. Um, our user facing part of our product is started off as a, a Rails app, pretty static. And then about three years ago, we rewrote the entire front end to be uh, a React application, uh, maybe even four years ago now. Um, and so we weren't experts in React four years ago. So some of the decisions we made four years ago were uh, were not perfect industry standard uh, decisions. And in fact, the ecosystem's been moving so fast on the on the on the front end as well. And some of the uh, data modeling tools that we're using just aren't even being maintained anymore. So we need to switch them out at some point. So yeah. Bit of technical debt there. And with uh, out of curiosity, with uh, like React versus, say, your previous experience with Ruby on Rails, I know that we, we've struggled a little bit with some newer technologies like, you know, we're using React or we, we work with Ember and just seeing how quickly those frameworks are evolving as new frameworks do. And it reminds me of like how Ruby on Rails was in the early days in some ways, but then you kind of reach this point of maturity in some services, you know, some tools, while other tools are kind of up and new and fresh and exciting, yet they're quickly moving and then how do you feel? Do you feel like the React community has a really good solid set of standards and conventions now? Or do you feel like it's it's a little loosey compared to, say, how maybe Ruby on Rails or some other frameworks you've worked with are? Oh, definitely, definitely looser. I think that, that Ruby on Rails was like, this is how you build it. This is how you do it, especially after, uh, was it 2.3 or whatever, when things started getting a bit more stable. Um, React, I think, if you are using React for separation of concerns let me build components let me have these components do one thing and one thing well and define the behavior of those components i think if you're all on board with that it's been pretty good since day one i think that the broader ecosystem is where it's much much less opinionated as you've probably seen as well the the fact that i think we're using redux right now and i think we're moving to a different uh, object data model i forget the name of the uh the library now but um yeah, Facebook doesn't even pick a pick a winner in this game. They're like, hey, we use this. We've open sourced something that we used to use internally. Um, but yeah, that's the hard part. I think if you just are talking about the um, the behavioral side of the components and, and how you nest them together and how they work, I think that's, that's been pretty stable for a while. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting you bring it up though because a story that that I, I don't like to retell that much but is is kind of fun is that when Simon and I were prototyping early versions of Bugsnag, JavaScript frameworks were coming and going so quickly that we saw one. We were like, this is great. We're going to use this one. And we used, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Or hopefully it doesn't exist. But Shopify had built a JavaScript framework called Batman.js. It's a crazy name. It was a crazy framework. But you know what we liked about it? It looked like Rails. and We've been working in Rails for a long time. We were building all this stuff in, in Batman and it was poorly documented and it was new and it was pre 1.0 release. And one night, Simon and I kind of looked at each other and said, do we even need browser side interactivity on this? Uh, we're trying to do a, a prototype here. And so we just deleted everything. Almost, we, let, we had like two jQuery functions to, to fetch something 
uh, in a static Rails app. And we rewrote all of that functionality overnight. We didn't go to sleep that night. But yeah, that was um, a bit more of the Wild West back in the day. Sure. With React and these other uh, frameworks that are available now. And that has been a thing that we've noticed ourselves is just, it feels a little bit more difficult to stand on, say, the shoulders of giants when there's not like some clear who the giants are and like specifically what are you using? Are you going to keep going down this path with these tools? Or I think there's always that, you know, when you're dealing with third party dependencies of any sort, I mean, it's a problem with Ruby on Rails projects that we maintain when you're relying on older gems or something that are no longer being maintained and you're trying to get some things upgraded. Those become a bottleneck, but then if you're constantly feeling like you're having to like switch out the, you know, your garage door all the time because someone built a better garage door all the time and it's, it can get a little bit uh, frustrating and you know, why are we going through all these steps if there's not really this good step of like or a good outlet or a good overview of how this is and if and maybe and maybe in a way we got a little too comfortable with the fact that Ruby on Rails was making a lot of decisions for us. I mean, not all the things that Ruby on Rails included still exist today, and they've made changes themselves as well, but it's still feel like, well, at least we're part of, we're going through the same pains together in the same process. Like, okay, we're, we're all switching over, hopefully at the same, you know, approximately the same time as we go through an upgrade project or something for Ruby on Rails, but, and we've done that enough times of like, okay, we remember that era, but with things like React and you know, these other frameworks that are out there now, it just feels like, well, there's like all these options, which reminds me of how writing software was before Ruby on Rails. And so it's like, well, we kind of came back to where we were and started. And so I'm trying not to be that like curmudgeon old developer. I'm like air quoting that because I'm still pretty young, but it's still, if it's an interesting thing to see this cycle happening in, in a certain way and not being sure if like, how much should I be trying to keep up versus this stuff works really well for us right now. And is it worth the, the investment to try to try to keep up with that? And it's, it's a weird thing, I think for probably some developers are trying to figure out if they've found their like niche, but then also not wanting to become, say, irrelevant and be put out of a job at some point. So yeah, it, it's it's a really, really tough balance to strike. I feel like we tend to lean a little bit more on the commodity side from experience. But also, I think that as someone who is with a CS degree, who until very recently was doing a lot of coding, who then moved into a, a founding role, you start to see the business impacts uh, of the decisions you make. And so even my example earlier of, of the Batman JS using that and then just completely abandoning it overnight was due to the fact that we had our own, we had to pay rent. Uh, and so we needed to get it out there and get it done. And I think that what I do like though is, is, is finding quantifiable metrics for, is this framework going to stick around? Is this something that we're going to build our company on top of? And so, I, you know, the, the classic one that, that a lot of companies use is, is, is this backed by another company? Is this backed by Facebook or Google? It's probably no surprise now that, that, you know, two out of the big three JavaScript frameworks are, that are backed by Facebook or backed by Google. Or has this been around for, for a year or two and has it got a bunch of stars on GitHub, especially when it comes to platforms like Node, where you build the standard library so weak that you have to build your entire application on someone else's components of a standard library. I, I, I looked it up the other day. There's about uh, 50 plus different ANSI color code libraries in, in Node. So, you know, how, how the heck are you going to pick which one? And so, yeah, trying to quantify this a little bit. Is this backed by a big company? Is it under active development? Does it have a lot of stars on, on GitHub? Are the original creators of this library still contributing to the library? I think that's an interesting metric for me of, of how alive something is. I think you start to lose the product opinion if the original creators drop off. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. It's interesting that that comes up on some of the projects that we're working on where we've got junior developers like, well, this project or this gem hasn't been updated in two years. Maybe we should stop using it. And then, but I'm like, is it working? And then like, what problem are we solving exactly? Can we continue working on it if it's, you know, if it's open source too, but it's still like that. There's always that like, well, maybe it's gonna not going to work anymore at some point. Who's going to take care of like making sure it works with the next version of Ruby or the next version of Rails? And, and then I'm always like, well, it is open source. We can make changes to it if we need to. But it's still, it's nice to kind of lean on the community a little bit for that. Well, that, that's interesting. I, I wonder if, if this is something you guys have thought about, but the concept of um, uh, SLAs for how up to date your uh, languages and frameworks are. I think that it, when it comes to things like technical debt, you, you know that you're just building up. If you haven't upgraded Rails, if you're still on Rails 2.3, you're going to be in big trouble if you want to get on, on the latest Rails. So um, something that, 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 that we do, we're not very strict about it, but we try and keep on top of, we should 
not be more than X major versions behind or this uh, many years or months out of date. Um, so that's interesting. I'm wondering if you guys have any kind of concept of SLAs on upgrade cycles almost. Hmm. Outside of just kind of, you know, the, the few clients that we know that are on older versions and trying to work with them on prioritizing the budget, there is, for us, it's usually, here's the version that we'll support, which might be a few versions before where the Ruby on Rails community is saying no longer so getting security updates. So that tends to be a good, at least as a consultant, a good way to maybe, for lack of a better term, scare some of our clients into prioritizing it. Like, hey, there could be legitimately security vulnerabilities you're not going to get a patch for because we're not taking care of this. And then I don't want to be the one that has to help explain this to your lawyers or whoever you're working with. Like you decided to deprioritize this and it's not our fault that you didn't invest in these things. So <laughs> InfoSec is a forcing function. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a weird, weird position, but typically we're helping our clients, you know, go through the, we're actually, you brought up 2.3 as an example. We're actually helping a 2.1 app right now get up to Rails 3.2 right now. And that's like estimating like a nine month project just for that. Uh, for that particular client, but it can be a challenge. And there's a lot of things that kind of play into that. I know that one of our recent conversations that we had had a couple weeks back, you know, you're mentioning like finding, uh, how do you measure technical debt? And and then you, you mentioned maybe this is something that you've been kind of ruminating on and maybe talking about in terms of there's SLAs for uptime for a website or a web application within an organization or for service, prov- you know, service providers. But you're thinking about that from a different perspective in terms of technical debt and bugs and such. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that when you break something like this down, it, it seems kind of obvious, but we think a lot about not just from from our development team internally, but obviously this is a core part of, of the product that we build, of how to have a measurement of technical debt or a common language at the bare minimum to discuss how stable our software is. And I think that one of the i mentioned at the beginning that in my definition of technical debt there's the emotional aspect but another measurement which is very tangible is is my application broken and i think the especially with older code bases or if you're trying to ship quickly and, and put new releases out bugs are the consequence of innovation you're going to ship with bugs and if you aren't shipping with bugs maybe that means you're in a safety critical space like fintech or healthcare or something like that fine but it probably means that you could move a little bit faster. The question of how many bugs is too many or how do I measure technical debt is, is, is one of the core questions we try and answer in our product and in our business. And so with the way that we've started building that and the way we offer this to our customers is how many customer interactive sessions were crash free. So, you know, as you alluded to earlier, I think if you ask people how many nines of availability or uptime they're targeting, that's a pretty common number for, for tech teams to have. They'll probably say, well, we're going for five nines of uptime. So you can measure that and have a common language and an SLA in your infrastructure teams and your operational teams. And we're trying to bring that concept into the application and engineering and product teams as well. So engineering teams might say, well, we don't want to have any bugs. We take pride in our work. We don't want to have any bugs, but obviously you're going to have bugs. And the product team might say, well, obviously we want to provide a great customer experience But a few bugs here and there is okay. So taking that concept of five nines of availability and uptime and translating that into stability is is kind of what we've been trying to build, this concept, this this stability score, which uh, is available in our product. That's awesome. And have you found there to be, you know, I actually haven't seen that in your product yet. And just as a disclaimer, Planet Argon is a customer of Bugsnag. um, And I'll let you kind of talk about what that is in a moment. But the... uh, yeah, I haven't seen that. So how is that? I know it like reports on the number of bugs, that are occurrences of bugs. And then are you also now tracking in a way like the number of requests that are successful as well? That's exactly right. Yeah. So it really depends on the platform. So on a client side application, a mobile application or a browser based application, we will track an interactive user session. So whenever you open an app, we'll start off a session at that point in time. But on backend applications and web applications, Um, we'll track the number of requests. So exactly right. Uh, We'll give you effectively the number of crash-free requests as your stability score. But yeah, so like, as you said, that that is now our new first point of entry. Like, should I even be looking at stability right now? Is, is my stability score above my, my got my target. And if it's below the next question is, is kind of what we started off as in Bugsnag land, which is okay, well, which bug should I fix first? Should I fix a bug that's affecting a key customer? Should I fix a bug that uh, is happening the most? Um, so, but even before answering that question, we're now saying, should you even be fixing bugs right now? Which actually 
turns out to be with certain people a little bit of a controversial uh, question to be asking um, for people who who want perfect zero bugs. Sure. I think most of our applications, we know that there is a, a, a number of bugs that are maybe not critical and they happen to such few number of customers under some weird edge cases that it may not be worth the investment to go figure that out at this point in time compared to like say shipping a new feature or prioritizing another bug. But that's, that's interesting. I'll have to poke around and look for that. Maybe just give a little bit of background on what Bugsnag is and what inspired you to begin building it. Yeah. Uh, so we have built Bugsnag to be a, a stability management platform. And what we mean by that is we'll help you understand which bugs are happening in your applications, how many times they're happening, what's the root cause of those bugs. And under the hood, what we do is uh, exception and error detection. So we have libraries, SDKs that you add to your applications. Those libraries sit in the background until we detect a crash or an exception happening. Once we detect that, we'll take a diagnostic snapshot. So we'll grab the stack trace, we'll grab state of the device that the uh, code is running on. We'll also grab things like user information, uh, something we call breadcrumbs, which is the user actions that led up to each crash. And the idea is we're trying to paint a picture of what's happened, how bad is it, and who's affected. And more importantly, how do I reproduce and fix this? And so yeah, it's kind of like a an evolution of, of, of logging rather than sat in the background ingesting text files. We're inside your application capturing all these diagnostics and looking at the line of code level of detail of, of what's broken and, and, and why. That's great. Yeah, it's, we've been using it for several years now, and it's been a it's been a great tool in our uh, here at the company. So, if you wouldn't mind pulling back the curtain a little bit more on Bugsnag's engineering team and culture, what processes have you put in place to help your team keep your own applications and code bases in a healthy state? Yeah, it kind of when you start off in a startup, I think every startup's the same way. Process is not a word that you think about at the beginning of the company. You just want to build, build, build. And we got to the point now where we had a forcing function. So, about three, four years ago. We're, we're based in San Francisco, even though my accent's not based in San Francisco. But we also have an office back uh, in my home country of the UK in, in a town called Bath. Our engineering team is, I think, about 20 people. I think more than half of them now are in the UK in our office in Bath. The kind of first thing that we had to do, if we were going to have two offices in re- remote location, we wanted a defined responsibility. So one of the first things we did was we split up our product into separate engineering orgs. Even though we're a team of 20, we have three and a half if you include infrastructure, but we have three core engineering teams. And so at that point in time, we had to decide who owns what, what are the interfaces between each of those teams and all of those kind of process things that you need to figure out. So each of those teams will have some kind of concept of ownership. As I mentioned before, over the past couple of years, we've been moving more and more towards um, service and microservice architecture, especially on our data ingestion side. Whenever we detect crashes, they get sent into this huge pipeline. That's what we call our pipeline team. And it does a lot of stuff behind the scenes. It might not look like it, but we're doing aggregation, we're doing filtering, we're doing all sorts of correlation math behind the scenes and alerting. And so each of these things that we're doing in this data pipeline is split out into a different service. So one of the things we've done there in terms of process is each service has an owner, And the owner decides what healthy and unhealthy looks like for each of those services. And that works really well when we've pulled out things into services, because you can, at that point in time, you create it, you can decide your rules, your SLAs around it. It wasn't always that way. We started off with, I mentioned Node earlier. Our data ingestion pipeline used to be a monolithic Node application. The guts of that thing are still around. The the, the last remaining parts of that that haven't been extracted into Java or Go services still exists out there. But every time we we come and do some feature work where we say, ah, we need to evolve this part of the ingestion pipeline, that's typically a good point in time for us to say, rather than let's use the dirty word of refactor, let's say we need to add this functionality into this area. So now we need to define ownership. Now we need to define which services needs to be in. And so that started to split out. For example, each crash that comes in a bug snake, we call an event. We have an event service. Uh, each event can be aggregated together into a, a grouped together set of events by root cause. We call that an error. There is a service called the error service. Each of those lives in a bug snag project. There is a project service. And so each of these services has ownership around the data, ownership around the transformation of the data. But yeah, we did not plan that out on a whiteboard day one. I don't think anyone's ever planned out their perfect application infrastructure, but we did evolve pretty well into that. And it's still a bit of a mess as every application is, but 
I think we're pretty good at extracting things out at the appropriate time. Nice. Are there some communication processes that you've experimented as well in that in that time that maybe any that you've experimented with and maybe didn't end up adopting? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. The process around that, I think, is I think ownership is the most important thing. If you have ownership, a lot of the how the sausage is made under the hood doesn't really matter, I think. Um, with the big time zone difference between our two offices, um, we've had to get pretty good at and tight at communication. So there's a two to three hour overlap in the morning in Pacific time. We'll try and get our meetings done at that point in time. We'll try and have clear agendas and clear action points. But even so, it's hard to do, but we try not to have the team in the US blocking the team in the UK or vice versa. So as much ownership as we can get is, is, is kind of the way forward. I think being too prescriptive around communications has the opposite effect. So we, we haven't really tried to force a rollout here when it comes to things like review. That's one of the areas we need to have standardization across the teams. So one of the teams will propose, hey, we need review uh, help across these departments, across these engineering teams. We're going to try and use this tool in Confluence or whatever it is. Let's try it out. So rather than being dictatorial about it and, and my co-founder and our CTO saying, we are using this tool, someone tries it out, someone rolls it out across multiple teams. If it works, it sticks. If it doesn't, we try something else. So I think having clear ownership and being flexible uh, is the only way that we've we've managed to make the process work. Nice. And is there a pretty good uh, culture of like code review and pull requests? Or do you do any sort of pairing on things? Not so much in the way of pairing. Everything's in GitHub. Everything's based on on pull requests. It's a, a bit of a hangover from waterfall days, but it works really well. And in, in that we do, the product team uh, will write the requirements and specifications and the engineering team will critique and review that. So it's not like we push everything down from the product team. The product team says, hey, we think we want it to work this way. Again, due to the nature of our product, where our product is used by software engineers, well, what, what better voice to have than the engineering teams in the product development? So that's the way we try and uh, try and push it down. But yeah, get, get our pull requests and product reviews inside compliments, uh, kind of classic stuff, I think. Nice. And in terms of thinking about uh, maintainability of those those projects and you having you know approximately 20 developers, do you often find yourself bringing in, say, more junior developers at all? Or are you kind of focused on people with quite a bit more experience at this point? And how have you, if you have, how have you been able to help them come on board with that? Yeah, so it's it's difficult at a startup. I think that with a startup, there's a lot of, um, I guess, tribal knowledge. We try to document this as much as possible. I think in the areas where it really matters, we document this stuff. So a good example on the product side would be our payments history and pricing. How do, how do we price this thing? But you might think, well, why does a, a junior engineer need to know about that? Well, it, it might be that, hey, why have we made this particular decision? So also everything is pretty well documented these days in, in Confluence or Google Docs. So a good example here would be the um, what we call our notifiers. These are the libraries that detect crashes. We have a specification for those. It initially started because people could write their own notifiers and create their own for weird, obscure. If you wanted to make a Perl notifier, you could do that. It's now pretty much locked in stone. And every time we make a change, we, we say, why? What was our decision-making process to make this change? So it's not exactly light reading, but typically if you're going to pick up on a project that has happened in Bugsnag land, you can go and read the original product spec. You can go and read the engineering designs for it. You can read all the comments on the engineering design where, for example, the engineering team said to the product team, there is no way we can build this. We need to cut this from scope. Uh, and all the whys will be in place there. So typically, that's a starting point for newer devs if they want to understand why we've made the decision, which I, I do think is one of the most important things. Nice. And I, maybe another quick story to kind of share a little bit of background behind, you know, before Bugsnag, I know you mentioned that you work in like fintech and other industries. Um, what sort of technical debt problems did you encounter back then? Oh, my goodness. There's, um, I worked in... Uh, in embedded software, I worked in fintech. One of the one of the scarier ones, and it almost became an urban legend inside this company. Was, but I saw it. It was real. Um, there were in the fintech company there were object files where the source code had gone completely missing. Nobody knew where the source code was. When I joined that fintech company, they were using quite an old version control system, pre CVS, and so the source code had just gone forever. It was actually, I think it was a series of bond yield calculations. And it was something that the math wasn't that complicated around. But someone had handcrafted these in, I think, in Fortran. And there was a couple that were in assembly, but mostly in Fortran 77. Everyone's like, well, we don't have the source code. This is ridiculous. How are we going to audit this? How are we going to 
improve this in future. And so people, I think a couple of times, try to rewrite this in C++ or in Python, and no one was able to get it as fast as the original object file. And so the object file was there, the header file was there, so we knew what the interface should look like. And every time someone had come in to rewrite this, they couldn't get it as optimized. So some wizard developer from from the, the 80s had made this super optimized code, and it was just nobody knew how it worked under the hood. The, ma- the math was like very well understood bond math, but... Uh, yeah, the the CS behind it was was missing. That's that's a great story. How long did you work in that in those industries, and how did you end up finding your way out to San Francisco? Yeah, so I did. Um, I did about a year in embedded software. Can we mentioned earlier about some there's some industries where you can't have any bugs. Uh, embedded software for medical devices that was that was an industry where you could not have any bugs. It went through multiple rounds of internal and external and independent um, safety critical reviews. That was slow. As, as a product person, I like to think of myself as a product person, at least, you wouldn't see results of that work for, for years a lot of the time. It would take two to three years to see that code in production. And then I ended up working in fintech. That was kind of fun. The company I worked at was um, almost ran as little startups. So if you're familiar with Bloomberg and the Bloomberg Terminal, each of the, the, the features and functionalities in, in the Bloomberg Terminal are run by smaller engineering teams. You have a tight relationship with the sales team. You have a tight relationship with the the people marketing those functions. I think that's probably still the same way it's being built these days, but that's certainly when I was there. It felt a bit more startup-y than, than a big enterprise company. Actually, I ended up coming out to San Francisco and getting into the startup world when I joined a company that was uh, in the Y Combinator program called HayZap back in 2009, early 2009, where I was the first employee and the CTO and kind of grew that through various pivots and iterations of that company. Um, and I kind of fell in love with it there. It was, it was like, wow, we can build something and the next day, uh, from idea to implementation, it can be live, especially in the early stages of the startup. And as again, as someone who, who loves working on product, I don't think I could ever go back from that. That's just, just so appealing. Nice. Coming back to you know your role at Bugstang and working with a handful of different engineering teams that are all they own different parts of the the product. What works in your organization in terms of getting permission to push back on say? some new product requests when you're trying to take care of some technical debt? Is there things that you've seen work well from people coming up to different stakeholders or you and management that have worked well and things that haven't worked so well in terms of getting the buy-in? Yeah, I mean, uh, we we try and use our own product. And so we look at things like our stability score and make sure that we're measuring where possible the technical debt. And that that does give us that common language to discuss this kind of stuff. So you can say, hey, like, no, we cannot build this new feature. It's not happening. But in reality, I think that I think we work we work in the open. We have we use Slack. I'm sure most most people do these days, and we have um, a product feedback channel and we have an engineering channel. People speak up about it. People will be like, "Look, we can't put another straw on the back of this camel. This is going to fall apart soon." And so, in our quarterly planning, it's not just the product team saying we must build these features. We have to acknowledge that we have the the drag of technical debt and the technical and emotional impact of that. When we're doing our quarterly planning, we propose the things that we want to do from the product team. But my co-founder and CTO, Simon, is a voice in that room and said, look, actually, we can hardly do any of that proactive stuff this quarter. Like we, we launched um, a couple of years ago, we launched a new dashboard when we moved everything into React. Some of the backend changes and the database changes we made meant we had really poor performance for, for a month. We looked at that metric and we said, no, nope, we need to get this fixed. We can, we're going to push back any roadmap, roadmap work and get all hands on deck fixing this. So try and be metrics driven, try and make sure we have a voice in the voice in the room at these decision making processes in Slack in real time and then in the quarterly planning meetings. Given that there's probably a number of people listening that might find themselves as, you know, they're an engineer somewhere and they may not have a voice in those conversations to be able to advocate at that level or to have a CTO that's kind of aligned with them and they maybe they don't have the metrics right now. What sort of advice could you give them on how to like help them get you know, their concerns and their emotional concerns with technical debt or what have you, uh, get those, get that heard and hopefully, uh, iterated upon at some point so that it's not just, I think one of the things that I've, I've talked with other developers over the years and things we see with projects we've taken over our engineering teams that we help with, there's always this like recurring story of that. You got a developer that at one point brought up like, Hey, we're getting, we're slipping behind on some versions or there's some performance problems over here or this area seems really brittle. And every time we make changes, it seems to re- introduce new bugs. And I don't know exactly why we did it this way, but it's the code base that I, in- I, I inherited it. It's like, well, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. And then after hearing, maybe not right now is what they're, you know, maybe a stakeholder or manager might've said, but they start hearing just no, we're never going to do it. And then, so they stop asking. 
And then eventually after a couple of years, they leave and they stopped asking about it. And then someone else comes into the company. They come in and they're like, they inherit it. And they're like, well, I guess this isn't a priority here. They bring it up and maybe not right now. And then it just becomes this like cultural problem within an organization that it never gets really resolved. And then sometimes we talk with those actual stakeholders and they're like, I didn't know it was that big of an issue or like, I don't feel like they raised the, you know, they actually said anything about that. It was an issue. And you're like, well, there's a disconnect somewhere. I guess I'm always to look for different ways of how to help engineers figure how they can at least help them, you know, step forward with some of that. So they're not giving up and just becoming complacent, I guess, with the, the status quo. Yeah, it's, it's really common. And something I've got two perspectives on this. One of them, which might be more interesting here is the fact that if you think about what our product does and our company does, we are helping people metricize and analyze stability and by reflection on that technical depth. And so actually, a lot of the people who tend to bring in bug snag into organizations are that person, they have a particular mindset. And we're not just used in startups, we are used in massive fortune 500 companies, where one person has come in and said, we can do better. The more I've been building bug snag, the more conversations I've been having with these champions at these companies, the more I've realized that these bigger companies, most of them companies, I can't name names, but companies that you think wouldn't care about software and technical debt they are looking for a champion internally to actually make a difference here. I kind of said this earlier on when I talked about startups, right? One of the weird things from becoming from being a developer to a founder was I had to think about everything in terms of business impact, I needed to pay the rent, I needed to pay the bills, that kind of stuff. If you can get good at translating technical debt into business value, that's probably it. If you can become a translator in your business, that's how you can become an effective champion. So Obviously, there's companies like Bugsnag and, and performance monitoring tools and other uh, tools that will help you with that story. But, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, healthy cynicism in uh, developers to say, hey, I need to figure this out for myself. But one of the really good things that we've seen is disaster situations, reflecting on those and saying, hey, we just launched V2 of our application. There was a really, because of this technical debt, there was all this bugs in the payments architecture, which meant that we lost money. Perfect, like measurable uh, example. It's not... It is quantitative, but it's more example-based qualitative. This is the impact of technical debt. And the other thing I think is uh, being able to look at the the upside generation rather than the downside protection. I think companies, especially in the business unit, care a lot more about upside generation. And so a way to frame this is to say something like, we could develop features faster if we remove this drag, uh, which is kind of how I defined technical debt right at the beginning. If you can remove drag, by reducing technical debt, you can move faster. And therefore, you are proving that you're doing upside generation. So kind of a two sides of the coin, downside protection, and your customers are going to be annoyed if you have bugs. And upside generation is we can build cooler stuff faster and get our customers what they want. Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, really optimistic and, and not saying like optimistic in a bad, <laughs> cynical way, but uh, it's a good... It's a good way to reframe things. And I think that helps, you know, I think a lot of stakeholders are like most, I have, I have yet to really inter- encounter clients that are, that are just like a hard no, we're never going to take care of things. Like nobody, they don't want to have this, like these problems. They don't want to cause pain to their developers by having to maintain things that are say outdated. But I do know there's like those weird scenarios where they're like, you're like an upgrade project, like, Hey, things have been running pretty stable, but we need to take some time to actually take care of some things under the hood and upgrade things. And that's going to cause some we're going to rock the boat a little bit through that process. And it's going to take some time and some budget to do that. And you're not going to get any new features at the same time. And they're like, but I want new features. And I, but I think you make a good point there. Just like how you can remove some of that drag or reduce the drag. So, you know, you can help things move faster, help developers move faster. I think that's always a good narrative. Like I, I will be quicker at my job if we can take care of some of these things. And I do, I do think as well that the, the, the wording that you use there is really important. I think the best way to get someone to say no to you is to say, I want to refactor this. And if you just take a few minutes to think about why you want to refactor it, not because it's cool new tech or whatever, but like, if you can say, we need to spin this out into a separate service so that we can measure the availability and uptime of this, or we can re- reduce the lines of code or whatever it is. But like, it, there's almost certain words in tech management that have become dirty, like refactor, it, it, it gives me anxiety sometimes. I want to refactor this. There's no reasoning. There's no why behind that. So I, I, I imagine that I've seen this certainly when people say, oh, I get a lot of pushback from my manager is because you're probably saying I want to refactor this and not, hey, a big part of my day to day is working on this old code base. And here's the roadblocks I'm coming up against. I think I could be more productive, blah, blah. It's, it's, it seems dumb, but it, it's so effective. It's if people say no to 
abstract concepts, not specific concepts. Well, great. I think it seems like a really good time to probably start wrapping this up. And I think I want all of our listeners just to go away and think about that and think about how they're approaching these kind of problems with you know the different stakeholders that they're working with to get the changes they seek to make. Uh, one last question. What book on software development do you find yourself recommending most often? Interestingly, uh, I'm not a big reader of software development books. So I'm going to answer that question with a completely different approach. So given that we were just talking about the concept of persuading people things, there's a great book by, I think it's Roberto Cialdini, uh, called Persuasion. And it is a less of a computer science book and more of a psychology book where it describes persuading people onto your side of the, the argument. And so I know it's not a direct answer, but I do think it's directly relevant to what we were just talking about. Persuasion, I think, is a good way to get into someone else's thought processes and mind to help understand what motivates them. And so actually, I think that's one of my favorite books that I've read in the, in the past couple of years. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us today, James. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. Two quick questions. Uh, is Bugsnag currently hiring? We are. We are hiring uh, actively in San Francisco. I think we have some roles coming up in, in Bath as well, both on site. Uh, full-time roles. Uh, we have two uh, what we call dashboard engineering roles open right now. So that is mostly front-end building componentized developer-facing tools in React. Uh, so yeah. And where can people find you online? I'm uh, at LoopJ on Twitter. I'm not super active on there, but uh, I do share stuff here and there. Uh, you can probably guess my email address. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much again. And have a good afternoon. Thanks, Robbie. Cheers.